I've mentioned linked open data a few times now, and obviously it's closely related to linked data. So let's talk about linked open data now. And the emphasis is on open. And when I say that, I mean open in the sense of open, so open source, excuse me, open source software or open educational resources or open access publishing. There are lots of movements, if you will, out there in open culture generally. And there's some disagreement about how to define openness in that context. Um, the journal, the Public Library of Science, which is an open access publication, um, has a nice succinct definition, and that is unrestricted access and unrestricted reuse. Unrestricted access, unrestricted reuse. And I think that's a nice definition for our purposes here because access and reuse are important issues for metadata. I think you can see why, probably given what we've talked about up to this point. But let's talk about that right now. So here's the situation. The web exists. I mean, that sounds like a dumb thing to say. The web exists. Of course it does. But here's the thing. The web didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago. So what happened? How did suddenly this technology become so ubiquitous in our lives, right? When we're talking about the semantic web, remember that the semantic web community talks about the traditional web as the web of documents. Everyone is using this web of documents. And now you want to go further. You want to create the web of data. How do you do that? Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to build the semantic web. So how do you do that? You can't do it all by yourself. Any more than any one person or organization could have built the web of documents all by themselves. It's just too big. The only way to build something at that kind of a scale is to get everyone doing anything web related to do it for you or with you if you prefer. So how do you get everyone in the world who's doing anything web related to basically do your bidding? Well, Back to the question of how did the web of documents get such wide adoption? So the main technologies that make the web work are things like TCP IP and HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, and HTML. And all of those standards are free, first of all, and they can f be free because they're open standards. Now, openness often lowers the cost of adoption of a technology. Think back to the unit on Dublin Core when we talked about the diffusion of innovations. Openness lowers the cost of adoption of a technology for a couple of reasons. First of all, because when the technology is free, you don't have licensing costs. And this is one reason why systems like Linux are so popular, because there isn't a licensing cost for using Linux. There are plenty of add-ons to Linux that you do have to license, but the operating system itself, there are no licensing costs to install it and use it. This is one reason why TCP IP, for example, took over the world when there were other competing protocols out there in the early days of, of the internet. The second reason why openness lowers the cost of adoption of a technology is because others have adopted that technology before you have. Unless you're a real early adopter, 
others have been there before you. And so, first of all, there's a pre-established community that you can go to for support on a technology if you need it, but also because of what's called Metcalf's Law. Metcalf's Law was named after Robert Metcalf, and it states that the value of a network grows in proportion to the number of users of that network. Now, the classic example, the example that's always used when talking about Metcalf's Law, is the telephone network. So, in this diagram, if you have only two phones in the world. If you have a telephone and only one other person in the whole world has a telephone, then first of all, things are going to get boring pretty quickly because there is only one possible telephone call that can be made. And how many times can you call that one person? If you have five telephones in a network, then you can make 10 connections. There are 10 possible telephone calls. If you have 12 telephones in a network, there are 66 possible calls that can be made. And if you have millions of phones, then there are millions or billions, I can't do the math on that in my head, millions or billions of possible connections that can be made. The value of a network, the value of being a member of a network grows in proportion to the size of the network, the number of users of that network. And the same goes for any technology. Robert Metcalf, when he first stated this idea that was then named after him as a law, um, he was talking about the Ethernet, you know, early, early technology behind the internet. You could say the same thing about social network applications the value of being a member of a network like Twitter or Facebook or whatever social network you prefer depends on how many of your friends are also part of that network. The more users there are, the more valuable, the more useful a network is for all of those users. Remember this diagram? This is the linking open data cloud diagram. And let's look at its evolution over a few years because it illustrates Metcalf's law, I think, very nicely. So the earliest version of the linking open data diagram that I've been able to find is from 2007. And there were only a handful of data sets that were published using you know, open data formats. In 2008, you get more. In 2009, you get even more. In 2010, you get even more. And you start to see sets of tightly connected data sets. You see things are, of course, centered around DBpedia. You see this area over here that's centered around the Association for Computing Machinery. You see some genetics data sets down here. So you start seeing communities developing, which is an interesting feature of networks. That's a topic for another course entirely on network analysis, but is an interesting feature now, nevertheless. And finally, by the time we get around to the 2011 version of this diagram, you have so many data sets that it needs to be color coded just so you can figure out what you're seeing. Again, the more users of a network there are, the more valuable the network is for everyone in it. The more users of open data that there are, the more valuable open data is for everybody. Now, again, note that this is the linking open data diagram, not the linked data diagram. Right? This is very specifically about data sets that use open standards. So what makes all of these data sets open? And the answer is that they're licensed under a Creative Commons license that allows for unrestricted access and unrestricted reuse. And I'll provide a link in the resources to the page on the Creative Commons website where they explain their licensing system. So the last question we have to ask here is, is all linked data linked open data? 
And the answer is no, and it probably never will be. There will probably always be a need for some data, some data sets to be proprietary, to be owned by someone or some organization for a variety of reasons. And I imagine you can, you can imagine business cases for proprietary data. But at the end of unit five, we talked about metadata repositories and harvesters, where an organization that can give away their metadata but maintain control over the resources that that metadata describes. And you can allow other people and other organizations to build on your metadata records and other organizations' metadata records. And that's good for you. It's good for you because it drives traffic back to your resources. You give away your metadata and it drives traffic back to the resources that you have control over. Similarly, if you want your data to be widely used, if you want your resources to be widely seen, there's nothing like making your data open. You give it away and you leverage the work and standards that others have done before you.